Welcome to the Hip Talks Podcast, a series of discussions about current legal issues hosted by Hugel and Ip solicitors. We are a young, independent law firm, but with decades of experience providing bespoke legal advice and exceptional client service to individuals, families, entrepreneurs, and businesses, both in Hong Kong and internationally. Hi, everyone. I'm Alfred Ip, a partner of Hugo and Ip. Today, we have the pleasure to have Felma Kwan, a very experienced barrister in family law, who will share with us her experience in dealing with family issues. Hi, Felma. Hello, hi. Hi. Um, perhaps we can start with um, explaining a little bit about um, the split profession. Um, a lot of people are very confused about um, the role of barrister and the solicitor. Can you tell us a little bit more about your work? Well, as a barrister, my work is predominantly court work, which means there are fights. By the time the matter comes to me, it's more likely than not that they will end up in a fight in court. So, in other words, um, if the party is not going to fight, not like, most likely they don't need you. Probably. You're right. Yeah, but then the, that means that they won't have the experience or the, um, the opportunity to have your insight about their issues. Well, there's always the chance of advising them beforehand. And if it's not something that they should be fighting on, that's what I'll tell them. Oh, actually, in a the, in the divorce situation, a lot of time people are in a very acrimonious relationship. Perhaps they're not making the decision very um, sensibly. Perhaps what they should do is to come to you to talk about those issues and... Uh, decide whether it's worth a fight. I think the starting point will always be a client coming to talk to you first. And you always have that first opportunity to listen to the story and to advise them at that preliminary stage. True. And uh, usually the client comes to us. We'll be talking about um, the background, um, understanding a little bit more about the dynamic between the um, parties and uh, understanding the real issues behind. Because a lot of time, when the client first comes to me, they actually don't understand what's the underlying problem and uh, what's the implication. In particular, if they make any drastic decision, like suddenly pack up everything and move out, they may regret it in future. I agree. I think one of the worst things is for any party just to pack up and go. I mean, once the thought of probably needing to leave a relationship, they should first talk to um, a lawyer. Yeah, um, I know that a lot of time it's not easy to talk about things um, like that, especially when they're embarrassed about the situation. Um, some of the time, it, things can be quite embarrassing, like um, domestic abuse or extramarital affairs. Some of the other issues could be a little bit embarrassing, but I think it's very important for them to have an open and honest discussion with us. I think so too. I think in a, in a, in a divorce context, it, it makes sense to, first of all, to make them comfortable. And you're right, it's very personal issues they need to talk about. I often tell clients when they come to me that the issues they have, extramarital affairs or domestic violence, they are things that actually is quite, unfortunately, common. And it happens a lot. So, so long as you can get them comfortable and talk to you about the issues, I think that's where their advice can start. Yeah, a lot of times they are not aware that it's actually very common for these kind of issues to arise in a relationship. Thinking about two people um, being together, there has to be differences. And there will be um, differences that may... Those people may not be able to be solved among themselves, especially when there are other issues, for example, communication breakdown or um, other reasons for them or internal um, um, drama or um, a, lot of the, a, lot of, a lot of time they simply cannot um, express themselves very well. I think I'd like to add here that for intending divorce parties, they should know that throughout their divorce pr process, there are various stages which there can be an amicable discussion between the parties so that they don't have to fight. And we're going to talk more about that, obviously. Obviously. Um, at the same time, they need to be upfront about the issues that they are facing. Sometimes it's very difficult to tell the other half that, oh, actually, I'm not very happy about this. Sometimes... They don't say it in the right way that actually escalate 
the differences between the parties. And uh, it come, it will, we may come to a point that um, it's very difficult for them to talk in future, which actually is not very helpful because when we are talking about divorce, actually we are talking about exit strategy. How are two people going to exit from the marriage and how are they going to resolve the issues that arise? Like The two major issues would be money and children. What are they going to do? I, I think I would actually flip it around and I said children than money. Because that's the way that the court will approach it. They will always handle the children's matter first before they deal with the financials. It's actually very true because without looking after the children, the, the court would not be interested to hear how the party is going to fight over money. Yeah, so um, perhaps we could, before we talk about money, we can talk about how to get a divorce. Um, in that respect, I think I can share a little bit of experience um, about um, how to commence a divorce. Commencing a divorce involves um, a couple of documents. Um, these documents involve, okay, the first document is called the petition. The petition is about um, um, basically setting out the material facts pertaining to the marriage, including when did they get married, where did they get married, where are they living, how many children are there, well, why are they getting divorced, and uh, what um, what. The party asking for divorce is also asking for. We talk about the relief to be sought. And at the same time, there would be another document called Statement as to Arrangement of Children. Actually, that document is very important, and we'll talk about it a little bit later. But before we go into that, um, I want to understand a little bit about um, jurisdiction. One of the, one of the facts that we had to plead in the petition would be um, the jurisdiction of the Hong Kong court to deal with this divorce. Um, can you talk about, um, tell us something about um, jurisdiction? Right. Um, for the party to start a divorce in Hong Kong, and with regard to jurisdiction, there are three bases. The party has either need to be domiciled in Hong Kong, or they have been residing in Hong Kong for two years, or they have substantial connection in Hong Kong. Now, that last leg is uh, vague um, and therefore open to interpretations. But I would generalize it by saying that there needs to be maybe at least a residence in Hong Kong or assets in Hong Kong to at least start thinking whether there is substantial connection in Hong Kong. And this usually involves people who have moved here from overseas or working here and they are not from Hong Kong and they might need to plead this particular limb to bring them within the jurisdiction of the Hong Kong courts. Let's say um, we want to get divorced and uh, I live in China and you live in Taiwan. Um, can the Hong Kong court um, deal with our divorce? Well, I think if you live in China and I live in Taiwan, I think that's a good start as to why we probably need a divorce, being so far apart. Exactly. People go. People who drawn being drawn apart because of the distance. But the part is, um, of course, for them to be um, to be. For example, if I'm living in Taiwan, I would say actually, I am only temporary living in Taiwan, but I'm actually from Hong Kong. My family is there. Uh, I intend to go back. Taiwan is only a temporary resident. Then I can, if rightly so, say that I'm domiciled in Hong Kong. That mm -hmm. will bring me within the jurisdiction of Hong Kong. Okay, but if you're not. Then if I'm not, then if I'm from Taiwan, living in Taiwan, then if I have nothing in Hong Kong, it's very difficult to bring me within the jurisdiction of Hong Kong. But how about if I have um, a house in Hong Kong? Um, can you rely on the substantial connection ground to um, get divorced in Hong Kong? I think one needs to look at the whole uh, context of the, of, of the matter. And I cannot say for sure whether one house in Hong Kong, where you may live sometime, constitute substantial connection. Um, and very often, that, as I said, that is actually difficult to plead and need more information to substantiate. Actually, I think, well, apart from that, we also need to look into whether there are other assets. Um, perhaps I also have a house in China, and you also have um, a very, very valuable um, company in Taiwan. In Taiwan yes. So the matrimonial assets together, Hong Kong property is only a very small part. Yep. That may not be uh, sufficient for a substantial connection. That's right. So that's why I said that you need to look at it in context, and you can't just say, I have a house in Hong Kong, therefore I claim to divorce in Hong Kong. 
Yeah, but then why would people choose to um, divorce in Hong Kong? Well, um, Hong Kong has a um, very generous approach to looking at divorcing, and this is based on the UK common law, and we have followed the UK approach in starting to look at division of asset on a 50-50 basis. Now, this is a very generalized comment, and it's very unfair to just take it out of context. But people come here because the the court will look at asset pool, and they will look at needs of parties. And they just not only look at what the husband has been paying the wife for the last 20 years, if you know what I mean. So basically, it's more generous and more... Um, in other words, you may get more. You get divorced. In yeah, Hong Kong. you can put it that way. Yes. And uh, London has already been regarded as the divorce capital, and perhaps Hong Kong is trying to build its name as a divorce capital in Asia as well. Well, somebody has described Hong Kong as a divorce capital in Asia already. Already, yes. Ah, uh, yeah. So that's clearly uh, an advantage. Um, did you get divorced in Hong Kong? Okay, but um, let's talk about. Um, let's say we can get divorced in Hong Kong, and then we we'll talk. We will be talking about um, the ground of divorce. We need to justify only one thing: that is, um, the marriage has been broken down irretrievably. Marriage broken down irretrievably. How do we prove that? Um, the, that's basically the, the the basis of the court willing to declare that the marriage has come to an end, okay. meaning that the parties has, uh, it's not, it's, well, the, the marriage itself has broken down in an irreconcilable way. Okay. And uh, actually, there are five ways that we can prove that. Either we have been separated for one year and we are both consenting to the divorce, or uh, we have been separated for two years and uh, I can petition for divorce without even asking whether you consent or not. Or I can say that you have been behaving in such an unreasonable way that I cannot be expected to live with you anymore. Or I can say that you have been um, committing adultery. That would be another ground for um, a divorce. Or you have been um, deserting me for over one year that uh, you're not coming back anymore. So that's why I need to get a divorce. But adultery is actually not a very common ground to be relied on. Mainly because um, in order to rely on that ground, I have to name the other person as well. It's quite difficult sometimes. Can you imagine a lot of time when someone has an affair? And it's quite difficult to find that person, the third one, the other woman, or we call it. And, uh, or to, men. Or men, yeah. And to call that past, uh, and, and to find that person, find where she, he or she lives, and to prove that they're actually an affair, a lot of time is quite difficult. But can we use this as a ground for unreasonable behaviour? You mean, you mean tying it to adultery? Or Ty, tying to adultery. Well, I, you're right. I hardly see any adultery cases, mm. um, and probably for the reason that you mentioned. Um, the the one that I see most is would be unreasonable behaviour, mm. and of course in the plea of in the, the divorce paper proceedings or paperwork, you would see that you need to list out mm. what is the alleged unreasonable behaviour of the yeah. other party, yeah. and and therefore whether uh, you can say he has extramarital affairs is one of the many factors. Um, you can throw it in there as as part of it, I guess. Yeah. But is it absolutely necessary to plead all the unreasonable behaviour? No, no. Um, you would plead as much as you want, I would say. And a lot of time, actually, if the parties can agree upon the divorce, the parties can consider whether to um, plead, we call it mild unreasonable Behavior, some mild terms like, such as the loss of love and connection, um, the loss of love and care, attention, or failing to um, contribute to the financial affairs of the family, some more general grounds. I think that's correct because you're trying not to get the other party all worked up when you are making allegations. Especially when those allegations could be sometimes quite embarrassing. That's right. So you're right. You, um, people would try their best to. I'd call it watered down basis of these unreasonable behavior and therefore put it as mild in terminology as possible. 
Yeah, but it very much depends on whether the parties have consensus over um, getting a divorce or not. Because if the parties cannot agree on the divorce, um, they may defend the suit, which we will cover it a little bit later. Let's talk about um, another thing that we have to plead in the petition, that is the relief. Um, apart from the usual um, relief, we will also be asking for um, we will be asking for the court to dissolve a marriage, and uh, which is one of the main things that we will be asking about. But also, we will be asking for um, custody um, of children and uh, ancillary relief. What sort of ancillary relief? Well, actually, what is ancillary relief? Because actually, it's a term that is not very commonly used in uh, normal language. Well, that's in essence the financial claim you're making against the other party. Yeah, and uh, financial claims in war, for example. You can um, ask for periodical payments, like, so, monthly, like payment, a monthly payment, like, or the American call it the alimony. Yes, <laughs> or of course you can ask for a lump sum, and and we call it a clean break, meaning that you walk away from it, the relationship is over, mm. and that there's no longer an ongoing payment on a monthly basis, which, which is sometimes a drag, honestly. Yeah. Okay, and uh, we apart from the uh, payment of a sum of money. Um, can we ask for other things like um, transfer the matrimonial home to me or transfer the um, valuable um, painting to me? Yes, there is the possibility of getting the court or asking the court to um, transfer, have the property transferred to one party. So, for example, if the party is co-owned by the husband and wife jointly, then you can go to court and says, I want to have the property as part of the lump sum payment due to me and have the property transferred to me. How about if the husband has already transferred a valuable property to his um, brother, for example? Okay, that's a separate conversation completely. <laughs> but okay. we can talk about that later. Okay, so, but it's possible. It's, yeah, yeah, you have to, if, if, and I think in a very general way, just to answer that particular question, is if you, if the other party has wrongly, quote unquote, transfer our property to a third party, there are processes in place to bring the property back. So if um, the party is trying to defeat the matrimonial claim by transferring out some of his own property... To someone else. To someone else, yeah, it can, it can be claimed back. There's a process whereby you can try to claim it back. Okay, very good. So, D- Sorry, just to come back to the relief that you can sort, uh, you, you mentioned transfer of property. There's also, court can also order for property to be sold. Okay. So a sale of property order is sometimes quite common um, to be done. Especially when um, um, a lot of time matrimonial property is the only valuable property in the matrimonial port. And you need some liquidity for the parties to live on. Yeah, okay. So um, apart from the petition, we also have another document called Stima of the Arrangement of Children, which I mentioned very good um, early on. The purpose of that document is to give the court a very good idea about the current status of the children, the current arrangement, including where they are living, who they are living with, where which school they are do, going, and uh, um, what is the future arrangement, whether there is any agreement among the parties over their future arrangement in order to satisfy to the court that the children are being looked after. In the event that there is no agreement, then uh, it has to be something that will be sorted by the court process and uh, that will be dealt with in in another proceedings, which we will talk about it in another podcast. How about um, mediation? In the um, but one of the documents that we have to start is to put in a certificate of mediation this document is to confirm with the court that whether the parties are willing to attempt mediation to resolve the dispute among themselves. And Thelma, have you been to a mediation before? Well, I have been to a mediation. I'm a qualified mediator. So you only have been to a mediation. You have tried to have a mediation to resolve parties' dispute before. Not in the context of um, divorcing parties. But okay. of course, the general concept of mediation, I, I would be able to share. Okay. Um, so, what is the benefit of mediation? Why can't parties just um, resolve the dispute over court? Well, mediation, you, you are sitting down with a mediator who's trying to bring two parties together and understand what the issues are and what they are trying to achieve. The mediator will definitely cost less than 
bringing any matter to a full-fledged proceeding. So cost is a main concern, and mediation will bring that cost down. Um, I think a, a good mediator will be able to dissolve the differences between the parties, and hopefully if it's, for example, an argument over money, whether it could be possible to come to an, uh, an arrangement or a compromise between the parties through a mediation process. What is the consequences of um, the parties not believing in the process of mediation and don't think that uh, mediation can help them resolving the dispute? In other words, they think that it's just a waste of time. Well, they either they can try it first, I think, and if they don't believe in it, then I guess they have to move forward with the whole proceeding. Would they be penalized um, in any form? I think not at that stage. Okay. But you will be able to tell me more. Okay. Um. Okay. Let's talk about um, a little bit about um, how is it going to what is it going to happen after filing for divorce. When one party, let's say for the sake of discussion, the wife started the divorce, the next step that she has to do is to rely on the, her lawyer to serve the papers on the husband. The husband, after receiving the papers, will have to indicate to the court whether they, he intends to defend the proceedings. A lot of time, the only differences are either children or um, money. They're not going to defend about the main suit, that is, whether to divorce or not. We we'll, we we'll just talk about the five grounds. If there's no context about um, those five, uh, any facts pleaded in those five grounds, the wife, who is the petitioner, can make an affidavit by way of Form 21 and swear to the court that the fact pleaded in the petition are correct and ask the court to set it down for trial and uh, the court would then pronounce a decree nine side. After the decree nine side, if the court is satisfied that the children's affairs are carefully or um, the children's uh, arrangement are satisfactory, um, the court will issue a Section 18 declaration. And uh, after six weeks, they will issue an order called decree absolute. That would be an absolute order that the parties are officially divorced and the, the parties will be free to marry again. But um, what if the parties cannot agree on the divorce? For example, the husband received the petition and think that, oh, I didn't know that my wife wanted to divorce me and uh, what she has said in the petition is not true. Would he be have, uh, having the right to have his um, version of the story heard? I think you are talking about the husband in that situation yes. applying for, uh, sorry, preparing for an answer to the petition, meaning that everything the wife said in her petition is not true. Um, the allegations are all uh, wrong and I'd like to answer to that. So there's a chance for the respondent husband to respond to the reasons put forward by the wife as to why the marriage is over. So that would appear as what we call an answer to the petition. And uh, if the husband believes that the marriage is over, but he does not agree with the ground relied on by the wife, um, can he rely on other ground to get a divorce as well? Well, in, in addition to answering what the wife's is alleging, which he probably don't agree. He can then have something called the cross petition, which is usually follows the answer to the petition. And the cross petition will basically state out his grounds as to why he thinks the marriage is over. Okay. So he can argue that the wife's allegation is incorrect. And then he said he will go to the court and says, please grant me a divorce based on my reasons. And that would be the cross petition. Let's say I'm the husband, you're the wife. I say that um, you have been behaving unreasonably. That's why we need a divorce. You can, we can put forward another ground. Yes, I can say you committed adultery. Oh, and then I can defend it and say that I didn't defend uh, um, um, uh, committed those adultery. Um, it's only because of unreasonable behavior that we had to get the divorce. Then I probably have to put forward an answer to answer your allegation about unreasonable behavior. But then... We go to trial. That's yes, that's a way. Uh, because, but if you ask me, the if both parties are in agreement that the marriage is over, it's just a matter of on what reason. Yes, and that is the basis for the fight. Then, I would say, 
it might well be a waste of cost. Yeah, and I think the court would not very much like it, right? Yeah. So, um, in practice, the parties may be encouraged to, to um, put forward a ground that both parties can agree. For example, if the parties have, separa- have been separating for more than one year. Yes, that would be the case because um, by the time that this matter is dragged on, it may well be one year since the they have separated or the divorce proceeding has started. Then it's quite, quite common for the parties to reissue a new petition and to base it on a one-year separation with consent and then proceed on that basis. Okay, very well. Um, Let's talk about money. Since the day of them issuing the petition, there will be another document that has to be filed if the parties cannot agree on the money issue. And we call it Form A. And the purpose of the Form A is basically to ask the court to give you a date for a hearing called first appointment. The first appointment will take place around four months after the petition is issued. And uh, 28 days before the first appointment, the parties have to exchange a document called Form E. Form E is called Financial Statement. It's a 20 odd pages long of documents allowing the parties to set out their assets, liabilities, income and expenses. And it's quite um, detailed and comprehensive. That includes um, the relief that um, the parties will seek an explanation over their respective situation. The Form E is a little bit like we call pleadings to set out the important financial facts, in particular those assets, liabilities, income and expenses, because in the future, the parties will be relying on those that are set out in the Form E to argue whether a party is having the financial resources to provide for another party. So that document is actually very, very important. After the exchange of the Form E, at the first appointment, there will usually be um, some directions being sought. And Thelma, what sort of directions would they be? Well, um, in the first appointment hearing, the court would have already have before them the Form E from both parties usually, because there are occasions that the Form E are just not there, not prepared, not done in time. But assuming the normal circumstances, the Form E would be before the court, and the court will therefore look at the various issues. Um, based on the Form E, he, the court may allow for further questions to be put forward, asking for more details, which are stated in the Form E. So, for example, if the If one of the parties said, I have a property in Shenzhen, um, and that's all he said, then the other party is entitled to ask questions about where is this property, when was it purchased, who paid for the purchase price, is it mortgage, and, and produce documents that support all the above. So that would be a questionnaire that could be asked. Um, Sometimes... um, Valuation comes into play, but it, it, this, the valuation might take place closer or later, closer to actual hearings or a later process, because valuation should be updated. Um, also, the um, the court will look at whether there are allegations of side issues that is in the proceeding. For example, a side issue would be um, one of the party may jointly have a bank account with his father and mother. He would say the money doesn't belong to me and um, and therefore the bank account or the money in the bank account should not be taken into consideration. And so in that circumstances, the court may, first of all, the other party may say that's not true, that money is yours, the addition of your parent's name is just for convenience, I do not believe that this money is not yours. So there are situations where the court will come in and say, look here, we have to determine whether that money in that bank account is actually part and parcel of the family assets. So side issues like that will be investigated and looked at, and if need be, a separate proceeding might need to be called in to determine this particular question. So a first appointment hearing, and there could be several first appointment hearings, the court will look at all these various factors just to make sure that 
all the information the court would have is required to eventually lead to um, a hearing on the financial matters. To make sure that all the information are in place. That's correct. And there's no more outstanding question to be answered. Yes. Now, I must um, put here first one of the very important principles of the divorce proceeding in the Hong Kong court. We always rely on full and frank disclosure, and that is really paramount in the proceedings. And full and frank disclosure literally means what it says, meaning that I have to give you a full and frank disclosure of all the assets I have, and you have to do the same thing. That means don't try to hide. Don't hide, that's right. And uh, I forgot to mention that actually Form E has to be signed and sworn by the parties who make it. So if anyone is lying on the Form E, the consequences can be serious. That's right. And I think when you are caught out that you haven't said everything, it doesn't look very good on you. So for example, if you uh, you declare that you have two properties, but actually your wife then says, no, he has four I know there are two more in Shanghai that he hasn't mentioned. Then then you would probably have to sheepishly go back to court and say, oh dear, yes, I do have two properties in Shanghai and I'll tell you about them. So that's one example that um, the court doesn't look um, very happily on people who doesn't put everything on the table. The credibility would definitely be damaged in that case. That's correct. The court would not believe in what you say. And most likely, we're going to make an order against it. That's right. And I think you, you, you can only say, I've forgotten a few times. And, oh, I forgot about that property in Shanghai. Or I forgot that bank account in that particular bank, which I haven't gone to for the last five years. But you can't keep saying that I've forgotten. So um, full and frank disclosure is actually one of the most important pillar of divorce proceedings in Hong Kong. If only the court believes that you have forgotten about your property in Shanghai, for example. I mean, you forget your property. That's not very credible, is it? Oh, yeah. But you hear stories like, oh, but it doesn't belong to me. It's actually my father's, but it's put in my name. Therefore, I don't remember it. Ah, I see. Um, Apart from the discovery, is there any other things that the court would decide at the first appointment? Um, I think most... There will also be a tendency to look at the financial, whether the financially weaker party mm. is able to look, look after himself or herself. So, for example, where um, let's say it is a wife petitioning, mm. she's always been a housewife, the husband is the breadwinner, and she's always been financially dependent on the husband. So, suddenly, when she decides to initiate divorce, she has no money. She may be living in the matrimonial home. There might be two young ones to look after, but she has no financial assets to her name. Uh, in those circumstances, the court and on her application would consider to give her some sort of maintenance to at least keep her going until the hearing, final hearing take place. And this we call the maintenance pending suit. Okay. So for the wife, it would be called the maintenance pending suit. And if she's seeking payment for the children, for example, towards school fees or transport or food for the kids, it will be maintenance, ma- interim maintenance for the children. Okay. And uh, the wife can actually ask for these at the first appointment hearing? Um, the right process is actually to put in a summons, um, meaning an application for maintenance for the wife herself and for the children. And these summons will usually be heard um, where the court will look at her application and give a chance for the husband to respond to the application. In the meantime, the court is sometimes also minded to give her what we call an interim interim maintenance payment to tie her down, to tie her over to the next hearing so that she has something to live off on um, in the, during, during the, the period. How about the legal fees? If she cannot afford the legal fee, can she also ask for some um, support from the husband? Yes, that is also possible. Um, It's possible for a wife who is, in the case, a financially weaker party to seek as maintenance something we call litigation funding. So it's a separate budget, which is a breakdown of what is contemplated to be incurred in the coming months. So other than, for example, she said, oh, I need $50,000 for me and my children. 
And for these legal proceeding, I probably need about $30,000 more. Then she can put all this into her application for the court to consider. And the husband would have the opportunity to oppose. Yes. Either on the liability to pay or the amount. Well, he will always... I'm dwelling on your liability to pay because if he's always been the breadwinner and he earns money and he pays the wife regularly, he will probably be bound to pay something. The usual dispute, of course, is she's asking for too much and I can't afford it. Mm. So at the end of the day, it will come to a balancing exercise between how much she said she needs Mm. against how much the husband said he's able to pay. Mm. Um, we mentioned earlier that um, there could be chances that the husband transfer his own property to another person, probably a family member, in order to defeat um, the matrimonial claim. Probably he was already contemplating a divorce, so he's doing some preparation work. We call it, quote, quote, preparation work. Um, how do we deal with those issues? Well, um, if... If this husband in his preparation work Mm. has transferred his asset out of his name to, for for example, example, a brother or friend, and the wife in the suspicion that he has done so believed that he had done it with the intention to deprive her of her claim, then she can apply for something we call Section 17 application, which is where the husband intend to dispose or is disposing or had disposed assets of the matrimonial pot away from himself. Now, um, it gets a little bit technical here, but there is sometimes um, the situation where if he actually has um, transferred these assets three years prior to the application under Section 17, then it is up to him to prove that he has not done it with the intention to deprive the wife. But um, if he has transferred it away more than three years prior to the application of Section 17, then it is the wife's turn to prove that he has done so with the intention to deprive her. So it's the burden of proof. The burden of proof that has sort of shifted depending on this three-year time. But um, coming back to your question, it is indeed true that there are people who have done it. So the, the preparation work in contemplation of a breakdown, they would transfer assets out, sometimes not to a family member, maybe, maybe to a girlfriend. And so, so and in those situations, um, maybe it's a property, maybe it's a $10 million from a bank account under certain guises or excuses or pretexts, and the wife seeks to bring it back. And that's when the Section 17 application is required. It sounds like then that actually putting some property into a trust doesn't really work in terms of defeating a matrimonial claim. Sometimes we receive inquiries like, can I set up a family trust and put a fat property into it in order to avoid the wife claiming it from me? Well, um, that is actually a really big topic Mm -hmm. and probably deserve another hour. Okay. But, we'll talk about uh, it another time. <laughs> but um, but just to answer that question generally, there, there, I have also seen clients who, who, who came to me and um, this is a wife saying that the husband had transferred the property into a trust, but shortly before the divorce. And personally, it is a Section 17 situation where, of course, he has transfer asset out from the matrimonial pot and put it somewhere else. Mm. So be it a girlfriend or a friend or sibling or a trust, the same thing will apply because he has moved assets out of touch. Now, if it's ended up with a trust, it is a different ball game because then it looks very much into um, what sort of trust is it? When was it set up? Who is the beneficiary? What else is in the trust? And where is the trust situated? Where are the trustees? Um, and whether and how long has that trust? Sorry, I might have repeating myself, but how long has that trust been in existence? Then all that will come into play in whether the wife can then attack the trust to bring the asset back. So it sounds like a very complicated issue that we should definitely talk about it again next time. Okay, with an hour in our hand. Um, let's talk about something more simple. We 
earlier Owen mentioned about the litigation fundings. Um, that is, um, the wife who is the financially weaker party asking the breadwinner husband to provide for her in terms of um, um legal costs. Um, what is the that um the court will look into um when they could when the court is considering whether it's necessary. Well, in the court, where the court is considering um, a litigation funding application, they will look at a few criteria. They will look at whether the person applying has assets himself or herself in their own name, which they can use, mm. or assets which they can deploy. Mm. I mean, they have access to it and they can bring it in and use it. Or they'll look at whether there's any asset that this applicant has which can be used as a security to borrow money and use it as a litigation funding. And in consideration this of this asset used as a security, of course, the court will look at whether the applicant has the ability to service a loan, right? So if you have a property in your name which you can use to borrow, but because you don't make any money and you can't repay, mm. then it's not something that's feasible. Okay. Um, there's also the criteria of whether um, the applicant can can have a charge on the outcome of the of the proceeding. Now, this is not something that's applicable in Hong Kong. Um, and the last criteria that is being looked at is whether the applicant has access to legal funding. Uh, sorry, public funding for the litigation process. Meaning that can he or she apply for legal aid? Mm. So those are the things that the court will look at in considering um, whether this person can successfully claim for litigation funding. Now, of course, at the back of that, the court also feels that the person being um, responding to that has the ability to pay this amount. Okay, but let's say that um, the financially weaker party um, has nothing in his or her name. Um, should he or she go to apply for legal aid or apply for litigation funding? She has nothing to her name. She has nothing in her name and uh, um, there's no regular income or she has always been uh, um, a um, homemaker and uh, actually there's barely anything that he or she can use to um, sustain herself. That's why she's asking for the maintenance pending suit. Um, there is actually the public system, as you mentioned, that is legal aid. And uh, a lot of time, those people are eligible to apply for legal aid in order to fund her, his or her divorce. So she, he or she go for legal aid instead. Right. So um, there are two parts to this, uh, to answering this question. So the first part is, should a person be going to public funds? One of the factors that the court is likely to look at is, should this person be turning into public funding for... Um, to assist her in her application. That means um, if the family generally is a very comfortable financially, comfortable financially, um, then the court will look at them and says, if the husband has a lot of money and he makes $200,000 a month, except that the wife has nothing, then it's more likely than not that the court will say, this family can actually afford to have the wife applying for legal funds out of the husband's pocket, so to say. So if the family is comfortable enough financially, then the court will say there's no need for the wife to turn to public funding for litigation funding purposes. So in other words, um, the court would be um, very careful in pushing the parties to rely on public funding to fund their own legal proceedings, unless there's a genuine need. Otherwise, the court would not let them get out of it. I think the court won't push as okay. a starting point. Mm. Um, the court will consider whether this is a family that likely to have the resources to, for example, um, to be more specific, the court will say, look here, if the husband out of his own pocket can pay the wife's maintenance and also her ask for litigation funding, then why should the wife turn to public fundings for that purpose? So, of course, um, generally the idea is, of course, to protect the proper use of public funding so that, um, so that the right party will get it. For ex and on, on the flip side, if, if the party is actually more um, financially um, not as well-resourced and they make less money, 
but there is still a need for interim maintenance payment, then maybe the wife should go and apply. Now, the other side to this question that I was about to say is that applying for legal aid goes into a rather complex formula. So it's not just about how much you make, right? You look, the, They will look at what assets you have, your income, your expenses, and the merits of your case. So it's not a straightforward process, and they're very, very difficult to say off the top of one's head whether the person is eligible, can, or should. But the point that is more relevant to this is whether the court will direct um, or will consider that this is the right party to seek public funding or, or from the other side. Actually, I can share from my experience that um, from my clients that um, applying for legal aid is a very complicated and painful process. A lot of time it would take weeks, if not months, for the process to be completed. And a lot of time they may get declined only because they have some assets. So it's not that easy. Perhaps in that situation, it's easier to get the litigation funding from the other side rather than drilling on the bureaucracy. What if the husband says that actually I have absolutely no money because um, those assets in my name does not belong to me? Well, yes, actually, you'll be surprised it happens quite a bit. Um, there are claims where there are two types of claims. One type, which is what you just said, the husband in this in, in an example would say, I have nothing. I have nothing myself because everything I own actually belongs to someone else. So, um, so therefore, anything that's legally owned by him, legally, for example, a bank account or property, he would say actually it belongs to a third party. Actually, I can come up with an example that a lot of people nowadays would pay for the down payment to buy a property, put it in the name of the son. That would be a very good example. Or even like paying the whole thing in one go and then put it in the son's name only for the benefit of stamp duty, treated as a gift to the son. When the son gets divorced, he may claim that, oh, actually, I didn't pay for it. It's my father's, and I'm only holding it on trust for him. Yeah, and in that situation, um, because the son said it belongs to my father, then it may be a situation where the father may be, need to be brought into the proceedings to actually state that the property is belongs to himself. Mm. And As likely, against the son. And likely that the father will say something like that because the son is getting a divorce and the um, soon-to-be daughter-in-law, ex-daughter-in-law, sorry, will um, um, claim against the house, his own son for the property. Yes, yeah, so that is one scenario where uh, we, we said this is, there's a third party involved. The other example where third parties may be involved is where, for example, the wife would say, Oh, I know that you have purchased a property for your father and put it in his name, mm -hmm. but I know that it actually belongs to you. So, therefore, in this situation, the legal ownership is with the father-in-law when she claims that it actually belongs to the husband. In those cases, um, again, we need to bring in this third party to, the, to the whole proceeding to determine who actually owns the assets. Now, in situations like this, we bring in a proceeding called the preliminary issue proceeding. And because there is a need to determine who actually own these assets, and also because one of the most important steps towards deciding the financial claim of the parties is to determine what is in the matrimonial pot, meaning that does this property, is the property part of the family asset or is the bank account part of the family asset? And because they are third party owning it or allegedly holding it for one of the parties, there's a need to determine who actually owns it. And very often in the preliminary issue proceeding, this will take place prior to um, the actual financial hearing so that um, the court can decide whether this falls into part of the matrimonial assets. So let me understand you a little bit um, clear. Just because I own a property and somebody bought it for me, doesn't mean that that belongs to me. It can belong to the person who bought it for me. And, and vice versa, if I buy something for, let's say, my father, your example, and then that I can be attacked for buying that property for my father 
being a part of the matrimonial assets only because it's funded by myself? I think it would depend on the allegation. So if I'm the wife attacking this latter scenario, yeah. mm. I would say, you told me, for example, mm. yeah. that it actually is your property, but you have put it in your father's name for certain reasons. And because it's actually your property, it should be the value of it should be brought back to be calculated for the financial divisions. Can I deny that I've ever said it to you? Oh, well, you can try. <laughs> okay, interesting. Just because that our, our property is vested in the person in the name, doesn't mean that the ownership belongs to that person. That's right. And one of the key steps in a financial uh, claim hearing is to determine what need what is what is the pot that need to be shared between the parties. So they need to put in. The, all the correct stuff, and therefore the preliminary issue hearing will help to determine what goes into this pot. The size of the pot. The size of the pot. I see. That's actually very interesting. A lot of people are using many different names to hold many different properties just to avoid being claimed by somebody else. And actually, these kind of tricks doesn't really work. Well, I think um, one has to be conscious that um, Family members or friends or or third parties are being joined into these proceedings to give evidence, and it will be um, something that you know you affect. It's, it's basically affecting people around you. So, if the claim is in that latter example is about your father, then sure, your father has to come into court to give evidence. And sometimes for an older man, it's not a very um, not a very amicable process. Oh, so that means that if someone buying a property for me, I may be called to testify to justify that actually that property belongs to me. Yes, and you have to be you have to give evidence. You have to be cross examined by the other side, and so it's not a necessarily a very pleasant experience. Oh, okay. Um, after all these are uh, sorted out, that is the size of the matrimonial pool. What would be next? Well, in in the divorce proceeding. After having determined what the assets are and usually um, having a look at the values of these assets, it can be properties or companies, then the, there, is, there is a proceeding called financial dispute resolution. And this is a very important part of a divorce proceeding because this is an attempt by the court to facilitate a discussions between the husband and the wife to come to an amicable settlement of their uh, of their claims without needing to proceed to a full-fledged trial. So um, in what we call an FDR, financial dispute resolution, what will be before the court is, of course, the party's assets. Um, there would also be some sort of proposals to each other as to what I want to give you or you want to give me or what I want to ask from you. And what the court needs to do is to bring them in and tell them, amongst others, if you proceed to trial, what is likely to this, what is likely um, to be the finding of the financial relief claim of the parties. There will be, of course, some reality checking. There will be also the consideration of if they want to fight this all the way, how long this is going to take or how, how much this is going to take. And the parties, hopefully guided by their lawyers or, or counsels, are going to make some decision about whether they want to settle it with the assistance of the judge or move on to a fight. Okay, so um, the FDR is actually a process conducted by the judge without the judge actually making a decision. The ultimate outcome is an agreement among the parties. That's correct. That's actually quite interesting because there are a lot of time when people go to court, they thought that they're going to get the justice that they deserve. But actually, it's not something that they're going to get at the FDR. Well, depends on what you mean by justice. It's a very fluid concept. Yes. Like that. <laughs> and I think sometimes one of, the, one of the best FDRs is where both parties come out with an agreement, but neither are completely happy. <laughs> so it is a sense of, okay, I've come to compromise. I want to get $20 million. I got maybe 15. Um, but he pays me immediately and not to over two years. You know, that sort of arrangement can be discussed at, uh, at, at, at an FDR. 
And the good thing is the, the, the judge is actually facilitating it. So there is a certain amount of respect for the person who is guiding us through the process because the judge will necessarily be saying, if this comes before me in trial, this is likely to happen or not likely to happen or your artist looks a bit unrealistic and maybe there's a need to massage it a little bit. And because it was guided by the judge, it's easier for legal representation of both parties to to then come together and talk and say, look here, this is what the judge seems to indicate. Can we use that as an as a starting point for discussion? So it's usually or it should be amicable. Um, and of course, the parties can be stressed out. And I think that's why having legal representation there and having the judge to guide the process is very important. So they actually understand what's the pros and cons of accepting or not accepting a certain settlement proposal. Absolutely. And they make the right decision. That's right, hopefully. If there's the right, if they made the agreement, um, are they going to sign an agreement on spot? Um, practically, um, I would always like to see parties actually signing something okay. which they have agreed to during the day okay. um, before they leave the court. Okay. Because sometimes people sleep on it and wake up thinking uh, that doesn't sound too good. Buy a remorse. <laughs> so um, it's always my my principle to at least get signatures on paper before okay. everybody takes off for the day okay. if there is an ability to come to an agreement. Okay, so there will be an agreement joined up and yep. then the both parties sign. We'll sign. And, and, the, and the judge will look at it and um, basically give an order in, on, in those terms. Okay, so it's not just an agreement between the parties. The court actually needs to look at it and make an order in terms of this agreement. That's right. That's, uh, that's one outcome, possible outcome of the FDR. Okay. What if the parties cannot agree after the FDR? Well, there are a few options. Um, one of them is they are close to a compromise, but it would be six o'clock in the evening and everybody is tired. Mm. <laughs> and they would go back to the court and says, can we have another FDR to conclude okay. this? Mm -hmm. Or they will say, um, this is not happening. Mm -hmm. um, uh, unfortunately, uh, we have to go to trial. Okay. So they'll go back to court and ask the judge to give directions regarding the trial. What sort of direction will the court give? Well, the court will um, basically uh, look at where things are at and see whether any further discovery of information is required from the parties. Um, maybe update evaluation, give a date uh, for the trial hearing and all that sort of thing the court will then consider after an FDR has failed. Will the same judge hear the trial? No. Actually, that's a very good question. Um, it will never be the same judge to hear the financial uh, claim of the parties. The reason is, in an FDR, it's more likely than not that the parties have put forward what they ask and want, which means sometimes you hear their ultimate um, position. Or bottom line. Or bottom line. And... Um, when they want to proceed to a hearing, they might just go back up and ask for more. So if a judge has actually heard your bottom line, then it might well affect the judges listening to the case where the financial claim is being heard. So they, there will always be a change of judge. Understood. Um, according to your experience, if the parties cannot agree after FTR, how long do they need to wait for the trial? Ah, that's a difficult question to answer, and that will very much depend on the court's diary. Um, but I would say it will first depend on um, whether there's any more information that need that is needed to go to the trial. And let me rewind just a little bit, because sometimes for the purpose of financial dispute resolution, the parties are more um, easygoing on agreeing to values. So, for example, if there is a property that needs to be valued, they may say, OK, let's use the XYZ bank website valuation mm. and that will be it. But if they are then proceeding to trial, they might want to have a proper valuer for that property. OK. So, And those are the things that need to be um, uh, sought and, um, and done before the actual trial takes place. So subject to any further information that's required to go to trial and to the court's diary, we may be talking about six months or more before the trial will be heard. Depending on the 
the length of the trial oh, as yes, well. Oh yes, that too. Because sometimes it's the hearing can be one day, or the hearing can be three days or five. So it really depends on um, uh, all these factors. So um, actually, a divorce can go on for years in that case. Yes, for some of them, yes. Oh, okay. Um, let's say that um, the parties have made an agreement, or eventually the court has made a final verdict after the trial. Um, when one party is ordered to pay another party, what happens if that party refuses to pay or fails to pay? For example, a husband is ordered to pay fifty thousand dollars per month to the wife and the children. Um, and he failed to pay. Well, there are enforcement process for orders that are made by the court. So, for example, in your scenario, where the husband has to pay fifty thousand dollars to the wife, and he paid three months and then he lapsed and nothing is heard of him, then the wife can always come back to court and says, "Look here, he owes me for the last nine months and he has not paid up, and therefore I go to the court to enforce the payment of these sums." Now, this process involves involves something called um, judgment summons, and in a judgment summons proceeding, there are two steps. The first step is called examination summons, which means the wife in this case, who is the recipient of the money, will go to court and call the husband into court and examine him on his ability to pay that money. So, what she's trying to establish here. Is that the husband actually has the money, but just not paying her? So it would involve cross examination of the husband's means. That would usually be called um, his updated bank statements, his spending pattern, um, his income. Before um, the the court would be able to hear whether he actually has the money. So that's an examination summons process. So it's a gathering of information. Updated financial information to support the wife's case. Subsequent to an examination summons, the wife then need to consider if she thinks she has a good case. She will need to go back to court to seek the leaf of the court to proceed to committal. Committal meaning that throw the guy into prison, right? Okay. Simply put. And so she would need the leaf of the court, and if the court and 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 the court will need to see what factual basis is she relying on. To it to support her claim that she, he actually has the money but chose not to pay her. So if the court is satisfied with that, there will be um, a, a second hearing again, bringing the guy in, where he's being challenged on his ability to pay and his refusal or neglect to pay the wife. So if the husband lost his job, then he lost his income and he cannot afford to pay. The wife cannot commit him to prison. I think um, in those cases, yes, if he has really lost his job, mm. and this is the basis for his non-payment, then it is actually the husband's duty, I'd say, to go back to court and says, um, "Hi there, I am no longer making this money because I've just lost my job. Um, I can't pay fifty thousand anymore. I can probably pay for the children's school fees. I therefore seek the court to vary the order that was made." Um, and if he's able to come up to proof of, of his change of circumstances, then the court will listen and consider a variation in his favor. So it's like um, applying for a payment holiday, in the sense of um, losing his job, losing the income, um, abatement of um, a certain period for paying the maintenance that he's ordered to pay. But will he be ordered to pay um, the same amount again if he finds a job later on? I, I think that will be. It would depends on what he's asking for, right?、Mm. If he says, "I, I will, I,、uh, I have lost my job. I will look for my, I will look for a new job. In the meantime, can I pay less?" And if he's being reasonable,、uh, but I will keep the court apprised of my job hunting process. And once I'm able to find a job, a comparable job, I will come back and inform the court. And and that will be a very responsible husband, by the way, in those circumstances. Perhaps in the circ in that circumstances, the first thing that the husband should have done is to immediately inform the wife, for ex-wife, about the change of circumstances, and ask 
the ex-wife to be a little bit more understanding and work out a solution of uh, how to maintain the needs of the wife or probably the children, which is his own children as well. And at the same time, I'm um, trying to get back on his own feet, you know, to maintain it, um, the family again. That would be ideal. But very often, what actually happened in reality is that he would stop paying. He wasn't talking to the wife. Um, and it's not until the wife chased him that he suddenly say, I have no job anymore. So, um, as I said, it would be very responsible um, men to say, look here, this is my present situation. I can't afford it now, but I'll pay you back later. That would, of course, be ideal. Actually, it brings up a very interesting question. That is, just because um, two people are no longer husband and wife doesn't mean that their relationship ends because they're still the um, father or mother of the children. So there are a certain link between the two of them, especially when there's a payment obligation from one party to another. It is still important to maintain a certain level of communication in order to avoid any unnecessary legal proceedings that may get to into further trouble. Dealing with legal proceedings is definitely not pleasant. It, that's correct. And I think one of the advice that could be given, um, and, and sometimes a woman that's not receiving the money from the man would not be thinking straight, is they say, OK, good, throw him into jail. And I said, that's not the point. If you put him in jail, then he can't, he won't be able to make some money so that you will be paid or the child will be paid his school fees. So let's not go there, but let's come back and see if you can negotiate the position. The other point that you are most correct about is that there will always be the parent of the child. And although their obligations towards the child will end when the child turns 18, they will always be the father and mother. Yeah. And, and and the court protects children, and the court will always put the interest of the children as the paramount consideration. And the last thing that they would like to see is that there's the parents fighting over each other or fighting over maintenance that's due to the child. So actually, that's part of my advice to a lot of people going through a divorce process is that they are actually ending a relationship, but at the same time starting a new relationship, but not as husband and wife, but co-parent. Actually, it is a transformation from one relationship to another. So it's not the end of a matter. It's actually the start of another matter. Among many other matters that has to be resolved, um, Thank you very much, Thelma, today for sharing a lot of experience with us about divorce. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Be sure to catch our other episodes of the Hip Talks podcast by checking the Insights section of our website at www.hugelnip.com. And please send us your comments by writing to our email address, hello at hugelnip.com. Also, please feel free to share this episode of the Hip Talks podcast with your friends, family, and associates. For the hearing impaired, you can find the notes and the transcript of this episode on our website. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Its contents do not constitute legal or professional advice.